ਅੱਜ ਦੋ ਜਹਾਂ ਦਾ ਵਾਲੀ ਦੁਨੀਆ ਤੇ ਆ ਗਿਆ ਹੈ ਪਾਪਾਂ ਦੇ ਮਾਰਿਆਂ ਦਾ This man is separating the wheat from the chaff a method of harvesting that is as old as wheat itself This will give you an idea of the society that we're going to visit a society that has changed very little in the last 2000 years in a country now called West Pakistan ਮੁਦਤਾਂ ਦੇ ਬਾਅਦ ਰੱਬ ਦਾ ਦਿਲ ਤਰਸ ਖਾ ਗਿਆ ਹੈ ਪਾਪਾਂ ਦੇ ਮਾਰਿਆਂ ਦਾ ਬਨ ਆਸ ਰਾ ਗਿਆ ਹੈ ਬਨ ਰੂਪ ਆਤਮੀ ਦਾ ਰੱਬ ਕਰੀ ਮੈਂ ਆਇਆ ਮਰਦੇ ਉਹਨਾਂ ਦਾ Our story takes place in the Punjab of West Pakistan Pakistan was part of India until 1947 when the country was split. So now some 900 miles to the east on the other side of India is East Pakistan. West Pakistan has a population of 52 million, mostly Muslims. There are some Christians, but they are mostly at the lowest level of society. The ancient Hindu caste system still dominates the daily lives of the people, although it has been outlawed by the state. This story was filmed by television photographer Michael Kalush who visited Pakistan on the invitation of an American missionary. It's a story that has become very close to Mike because it brought him close to death. So in telling the story we should use Mike's own words. This is the Punjab before the ground has been cultivated or houses built. It is nothing but a hot, dry, sandy desert where summer temperatures get up to 130 degrees. There are about 40 million Pakistanis who try to make a living on this desert, and 90% of those 40 million people live like those you're going to see in this story. They live in little villages similar to this one. These villages are peppered all over the desert. There doesn't seem to be any rhyme or reason about their location. They're just there. These are villages of mud huts, and in these huts live both people and animals. Here is a typical setting for one of the villages out in the middle of nowhere. And that wall around the area is built to protect the people against the desert bandits. These bandits are not just fairy tales in Pakistan. They come in the evening and they rob and they kill. But the walls give some protection. In one of these compounds there probably will be 8 or 10 people living there. They have no furniture except string beds. The hut walls are made of mud. and when it rains well sometimes they wash away and have to be partially rebuilt and on a cold winter night when the temperature gets down to 50 degrees a family will frequently bring in one of these cows to keep the hut warm and sometimes they'll cuddle up to the cow to keep themselves warm and the desert sand is still plowed with wooden plows even wood is very valuable in pakistan because lumber and trees are scarce And so this old wooden plow has been handed down from generation to generation. Most of the people we will be visiting are poor tenant farmers. They are usually destitute and often are so far in debt to their landowners that they will never get out of debt. see two team of oxen 
You know, it's a sign of a wealthy landowner. It's a status symbol. And you might wonder how they can grow crops in this desert sand where it doesn't rain and there's no water. Well, about 100 years ago, when the English were in India, they dug these canals. This canal carries water from one of the five rivers flowing through the Punjab. In fact, Punjab means five rivers. And from these big canals, the Punjabis dug a smaller canal. Then from the side of that canal, a smaller canal, until finally the water is channeled into their small fields. And they use this canal water to cook with, to bathe in, to wash their clothes, and to flood their fields. And it carries almost every disease that water is capable of carrying. It looks like this farmer is just throwing seed hither and yon. Actually, he's very skillful with every movement of his hand. And his crop will be very uniform. Without modern tools to help them, the Pakistanis have retained the ability to skillfully use their hands at many trades. For many thousands of these people, the only communications they have with the outside modern world is a Dominican missionary priest, Father Warren Dennis. He has been in the Punjab of Pakistan for the past seven years. And because many of these people never wander more than 15 or 20 miles from where they are born, Father Dennis is their main contact with the outside world. But these people get to see him only once every six months, because that's how long it takes him to make his rounds of the villages, even in this modern vehicle. Here, Father Dennis is baptizing babies. These babies have less than a 50-50 chance of reaching the age of two or three. And these mothers holding the babies, they'll die at an average age of 29. As you can see, these are very real people. And so when one of their babies die, the mother cries, just as they do in our country. They are very much human beings, but without the opportunities and advantages that we have in the United States. The clothing doesn't look too bad, but what they have on their backs, in most cases, is all they have. The scarcity of water makes it very difficult to wash either themselves or that suit of clothes. So the odor becomes very strong. And any clothes that resemble our Western clothes were given them usually from the Thanksgiving Day collections in America. Much of Father Dennis's work is not strictly spiritual or priestly work as we know it. His work includes so many things that they call him Mamba, which means Mother Father, and they take that literally. They come to him with all their problems, and he takes care of them when he can. In addition to medicine and food, he fights legal battles for them. Fellow Pakistanis and the rich landowners are frequently taking advantage of these farmers and the farmers can't get into their offices to try to do something about it. But a white priest is allowed in, and Father Dennis gets in and argues for them. In Pakistan, you can't pick up a telephone directory and find the addresses of these people. Even their own government doesn't know exactly where they live. There often are no roads or maps to find them. So this man sitting on the cot helps the missionaries find their parishioners. He's called a catechist. Father Dennis has five of these catechists on his staff. They make the tour ahead of him and tell the people when Father Dennis is coming so they can prepare for him. And the furniture and belongings that you see are borrowed from landowners for the priest's visit. These people don't even own chairs, so they have to borrow them. They also borrow pictures to dress up their mud huts for the big occasion when the priest visits their village. 
But Father himself doesn't know where these people are. And when he visits each village every six months, he must depend on the catechist to show him where the Christians live. This was one of the most beautiful things photographed by my Kalush in Pakistan. The Holy Mass celebrated in a mud hut with only the light of the candles. You might find it a little difficult to see in these films, but you're seeing better than Mike actually did when he was there, because he had to use a portable light to get enough light to film it. And the Mass here in this dirty mud hut had just as much dignity and just as much beauty as it does in our marble cathedrals. After the service, the catechist removes the altar. And if this is the priest's last stop for the day, he may well spend the night sleeping in the hut. And bats and rodents will come out of the thatched roof made out of palm leaves and shrubs. Father lives off the Gospels just like early ministers did. Because he can't take his food with him and there is no place to buy it, he must depend on his people to provide him. His diet consists of a cup of tea for breakfast, for lunch, usually nothing. And for supper, another cup of tea and a couple of chapatis. A chapati is a round wheat cake. He might also have a few vegetables. That's what he lives on for five days of the week. The next morning, Father is up early and takes what he calls his shower. Then it's on to the next village where he'll face most of the same problems all over again. But in each case, he must take a personal interest, remembering that each individual sees him only once about every six months. And much of his time actually is spent in traveling. Those people, by the way, on the right are actually men, not women. The women wear trousers and the men wear dresses in Pakistan, so you have to reverse your thinking a little bit. At first, Mike thought they were just homely girls. A well, father's visits last anywhere from two to three hours to a whole day. On the way, he stops and visits places where he knows he can get water. He'll visit people like this man who received a tremendous amount of comfort out of Father Dennis, just stopping to give him his blessing and talking with him for a minute. One of the first things Father does when he gets to one of these villages is to have a meeting to discuss their problems and find ways to help them. He'll find out how many babies were born since the last time he was there, and then he'll baptize them. The missions now keep birth records, but before the missions, these people didn't keep track of how old they are. They used a point in history as a reference to about how old they are. Some villages have only one Christian family, like that of this lady. The catechist was late in telling her that father was coming, so just like a woman in this country who gets unexpected company, she scurried around to tidy up the little mud hut. Had she known ahead of time that the missionary was coming, she would have dressed up the house by putting a new coat of cow dung and mud on the floor. It takes a tremendous amount of courage in this Muslim society to remain a Christian, especially when you can only see other Christians once or twice a year. When Father comes to one of these villages where there is just one family, he gives them the same attention he does where there may be 20 or 30 families. He spends the same amount of time with each individual as is needed for that visit.
Father Dennis was in the U.S. Marine Corps for four years. He then received a master's degree in English at the University of Chicago. And then he decided to become a priest. And he entered the seminary for 10 more years of study. But despite all that education, they never did wash all the Marine out of him. And he still likes to lead the troops and wears his old Marine Corps jacket and hat. After about five days of touring from village to village, the diet and lack of rest begins to show even on an old Marine. And Father heads back to the main mission house. He spends Saturday and Sunday at the main house. He'll eat more substantial food and get two nights of good rest before once again heading out into the desert. The main mission house is located in an all-Christian village. The Dominicans have two of these villages where they encourage a number of Christians to come and live. This is one of those villages. It's called Fatimapur. One reason it's named that is because in the Catholic religion there is the Lady of Fatima. And also it's named Fatimapur because the prophet Muhammad in the Islamic religion had a daughter named Fatima. And with many Muslims living or working in the village, the name Fatimapur keeps everybody happy. Notice the new look in the mud huts here. There are no high walls around them. Also, the people are separated from the animals. This was not easy to do, and would be like uh, trying to teach Americans that they can't have their pet dog in the house. But most important, these people are learning to cooperate with each other and accomplish common goals by living together in communal living. Before, when each family would build its own wall or road. Here at Fatimapur, they are taught to build things together and that all can use them together. They are also taught cleanliness. And while the houses here are still made out of mud, they are clean inside. Life in the two Christian villages is similar to a small city. There is a church and a little school. And the people seem to be much happier and more content. The government of Pakistan sometimes sets aside land for a Christian community, and the people pay for it over so many years. Well, it's tough going at the start, so the mission almost supports everyone for the first few years until the land can be developed for raising crops. Owning land gives the people a sense of dignity that they wouldn't have as tenant farmers or sweepers in the city. Well, they don't have radios or television in the desert, but news travels fast. These ladies gather at the well to wash their clothes or their babies and exchange the latest gossip. They find out why Mary Lou hasn't come out of her mud hut for the last week or so. It's just like a backyard fence. And the same with the men. They get together and discuss crops or last night's wrestling match out in the desert. That man on the right is a barber. He tours from village to village with his valuable razor. Even the very poorest farmers get shaves because they don't own a razor of their own. By the way, that barber doesn't use soap or lather, just water. Mike says he got a shave like that just once. The men in Pakistan don't seem to do much work compared to the women. Oh, the men plow and plant, but the women are working all the time. These women are taking food, some tea and wheat cakes, to their husbands in the fields. The women also weave baskets out of palms. And they churn the butter when they are lucky enough to have a churn and the cream to make butter. This farmer happens to have two head of cattle, which is an unusual sight. They're skinny and probably diseased, but at least they are providing a few dairy products. And like everything else, they are very valuable. Actually, nothing is wasted in Pakistan. 
and you'll find no litter bugs because there's nothing to throw away. This girl is patting up cow dung, which they use for fuel. It's one of the oldest forms of fuel known to man. They patty them up while they're still moist and then paste them onto the side of their mud hut. When the sun dries them, they fall off. When they fall off, they're ready to burn as fuel. It's very simple. And these are the chapatis or wheat cakes. The same girl, by the way, after washing her hands, is patting them also. They are then cooked on top of the burning cow dung. And this is Pakistan tea. It has a strong odor for American noses and a sickly sweet taste for American tongues. We'll tell you how they make that sugar in a few minutes. You know, in many parts of the country, you can't run down to the local department store for wearing apparel. So you make your own by starting with a cotton seed. You plant the seed and you grow the cotton. Then you pick the cotton. Then you squeeze out the seeds on your homemade cotton gin. And when you have enough raw cotton, you spin the thread on your home-built spinner. Well, looms are expensive to make, so you then take your thread to the man in the village with a loom. And one thread at a time, he'll make the cotton cloth for you. This loom, by the way, was handed down for several generations in the same family. And then after you get the cotton material made, you have your wife, or ask grandmother, to make the clothes you need. This is a typical sight in the Punjab. The man on the left is smoking a hookah, and the man on the right is chewing sugar cane. When it's in season, everyone chews sugar cane. The young, the old, all chew sugar cane. And look, Ma, no cavities. And I use nothing but a stick. Mike says they have beautiful teeth and actually use just an old piece of wood to brush their teeth. And they don't fuss much over buying new hats either. These beds are called charpoys. And you see them all over the Punjab, along the roads, on the farms, on people's heads, and in the villages. They are used for everything. For example, when someone comes for a visit, the first thing you do is to get your charpoy and you sit down with your visitor. Then the man of the house will get his hookah, the smoking water pipe, and you'll sit down and smoke together. By the way, you have to smoke the hookah when you go to visit or else you'll offend them. This type of smoking is very common in the East. They also burn that cow dung in the hookahs. Well, this is the sugar we we're telling you about. This is the way they make it. It's another reason why Mike said he didn't like the sugar-flavored tea. Despite their backward ways, the Punjabis are very likable people and they would do most anything for Mike when he started to work his camera. They'd show him anything they had, first came the babies. They're very proud of them, and the first thing they'd do when Mike got to a village was to show them their babies. And they would also just stand and stare, because being light-skinned and carried a movie camera made Mike stand out as something seldom seen. In fact, for most of these people, this was their first look at a movie camera. And it was frequently difficult to get them to act normal. Watch this little fellow and you'll see the problems in shooting this film. And after a while, you just sort of give up and let them look. Wrestling matches in Pakistan are an amazing thing. It's their main form of entertainment, and they hold a wrestling match almost every week. 
But how these people find out when and where the matches will be held is still a mystery to most Westerners. These fancy dances performed by the wrestlers makes you wonder how legitimate the matches will be. But the matches are on the level and a wrestler carries a lot of prestige in the community. Notice the men doing the dancing and the hand waving. But the women aren't allowed to come to these public functions, so the men do all the dancing and the entertaining. This is Pakistan's version of Dick the Bruiser. Like other wrestlers, he travels from village to village, wherever he can arrange a match, and he makes a living from it. Of course, anyone in the Punjab who gets that heavy has a living made wrestling. The object of the match is to touch your opponent's shoulders to the ground one time. You don't have to hold him down for any length of time. It's a very rough sport, by the way. They have to hire these policemen for the bigger wrestling matches because the fans get rough. They place bets on the wrestlers, and a wrong word from one of the fans can result in a minor riot. So the policemen are hired to maintain order. obviously knew what a camera was. And whoever wins the match has the right to pass the hat in the crowd for money. And you pay him according to how well you liked his performance. An interesting sidelight about the wrestlers is that they anoint themselves with oil before they fight. It's supposed to strengthen them. But it also makes them very slippery. And when they get in the middle of the ring, they have to throw sand on each other so they can wrestle without losing their holes. After the regular wrestling match, they play a game similar to pom-pom pull-away that we played as youngsters in this country. But it's much rougher over there. You have to stop your opponent from reaching the other side. It's very manly to take any punches or slaps your opponent gives you. And it gives the youngsters a chance to show their stuff. Here is another very important reason for gathering the Christians together. They have a school and they get an education. This country is 80% illiterate, and there's not much the missionaries can do for the older people, but these children are the future leaders of their society. The parents of many of these youngsters do not live in the Christian village, but the missionaries have gathered them together from the smaller villages and provide room and board during the school season. The Punjabis are very tolerant people. They don't care because you can't speak their language or because you don't wear clothes like they have on. And there's one little boy who went to school every morning even though he couldn't have been more than two years old. But no one seemed to object. They tolerated him and just let him go. And you'll notice he showed up in the front of the line. These are the teachers. They are paid and trained by the missionaries. It's another big expense, especially when you consider they first have to educate them by providing them with the equivalent of an eighth grade education. That's a lot of education in Pakistan. The school buildings are made out of the mud bricks. And inside there is little furniture, just a few chairs and a blackboard. The students don't use desks, they sit on the floor.
The children have a genuine appreciation of their school. They aren't forced to go. Their fathers and grandfathers signed their names with thumbprints, and these boys and girls have a tremendous feeling of pride in just being able to write. They like school and are eager to attend. This woman is teaching with her baby in her arms. It's not an uncommon sight in Pakistan to see women doing all sorts of work, carrying their babies with them. Remember we mentioned there's a scarcity of lumber, and so it follows there is also a scarcity of paper. Paper is valuable and very expensive, and these little children use writing boards in school. They use a stick and a form of ink that looks like a dye. During the class periods, they write on the boards, and at night when school is over, they go down to the canal and wash off the ink so they can use the board again the next day. Father Dennis's role in these Christian villages is a little different than the role he plays out in the desert villages. This is more like a family for him. It's a place to come back to at the end of his tours, and he knows the people like close friends. He takes a walk around the village when he gets back to see how everyone is, and find out if any new problems have come up, and also he visits the sick. This man is blind, a common malady in Pakistan because of the poor sanitary conditions. If father can, he will take this man for professional care or else get medicine for him. That two days at the village is a busy period even though he's supposed to be resting. He's on the go an average of 18 hours a day, much of his time planning next week's tour. This includes training the catechists. He also spends the weekends training the school teachers. He must pay them and the other mission workers. He must also take care of many personal problems of his villagers. It's a very busy two days. Like most missionaries, those in Pakistan have brought with them special training outside of their spiritual abilities. Well, Father Dennis is good at building and construction. The marine that he is, he digs right in to help build a new hut. This tree or piece of wood, which we'd pay to have hauled off of our property in America, is worth about 35 American dollars in the Punjab. The mission finances much of the construction of these huts, which cost about 100 American dollars to build. This includes the main support, like this tree, plus the wood trim for the doors and the windows. The bricks, they make themselves out of clay, letting them bake in the sun. And then when they're done putting up the bricks, they'll plaster the outside with more mud. If they get a hard rain, then they have to replaster only the outside wall instead of building up the whole wall. It looks rather flimsy, but the construction is actually quite sturdy. Father also knows quite a bit about agriculture. He knows what will grow and what won't grow in the sand, and how and when to plant it. He passes the information along to his people. Transporting sick people to the hospital is also an important part of his job. This young man almost ended this film at the halfway point because he gave spinal meningitis to Mike Kalush and to two other missionaries who took care of him. He didn't have it himself. He had pneumonia, but he was carrying spinal meningitis. And they had to make a 60-mile trip with him to the hospital. It took almost all day because you can only travel 10 or 12 miles an hour on the desert. And they were afraid that the man would die before they got him to the hospital. But it was better to try to get him there than to leave him to die. He lived, by the way. Mike spent three days in a coma. Well, death is never pleasant, but Father adds a lot of dignity to people's deaths. 
They have the comfort of having someone pay attention to them. He just happened to be walking through this village and this old man yelled to him, Hey, Father, I'm 150 years old and I want to be baptized. So Father got his equipment, went back and baptized him and gave him the last rites of the Catholic Church. About two weeks later, the old man died. Here's another case of Father Dennis playing the role of the Manba, the mother-father. This is a fight, and it's not a staged one either. They are arguing over water and want Father to settle it for them. Well, he wants them to learn to make their own decisions. So he's taught them how to form their own discussion groups and to think through their problems until they come up with the best possible decision. Well, go to it, boys. Go sit down and discuss it. And even though they've now made their own decision, they want to come back and tell the man Bob about it and ask if it's all right. But even if it's a wrong decision, providing it doesn't harm anyone, he'll let it go. That way they'll learn to live with wrong decisions as well as the right ones. Christians carry on a lot of Eastern customs into their Christianity. For example, the women and the men do not worship together. The men worship on one side of the church and the women on the other. Another thing is that they always take off their shoes before they worship. These customs are all very acceptable by the missionaries. This Christian village of Loreto is a landmark because the church stands out in the middle of the desert. There's nothing around it, there are no roads going to it, but it's there. One big difference between the first village of Fatimapur and this village of Loreto is this diesel engine. One of the missionaries wrote an article printed by a national magazine in the United States, and he used the $2,500 he got for the article to buy this engine and the water pump. 30 feet below the desert surface, they found enough water to irrigate their fields. And under the direction of Father Gregory, they drilled a tube well and now they no longer have to depend on the canal water to irrigate their crops. This desert sand, by the way, will go good crops, but it needs a lot of water. And so the diesel engine is now used for many other village jobs. They use it to grind wheat and as motive power for other machines formerly operated by hand. Someday they hope to use it for electricity. This minor industrial revolution at Loreto was brought about through the talents of Father Gregory. He engineered the tube well because he knows water and how to get it. While Mike was filming, a leak developed in their dike leading from the pump house. It was interesting to note how they patched it up without shutting off the water. And Father Gregory let them do it without his help. There are miles and miles of these canals around their fields. These are all dug by hand with a little tool that looks like a short hole. That's one reason it takes several years to get the first crops in the new Christian villages. This is Father Tim. He's in charge of Loretto. This day he was passing out clothing that was sent to him from the Thanksgiving Day clothing collection in the United States. These people are happy to accept anything. They make no distinction between men's or women's clothing. They'll wear most anything that will cover them, 
and will take anything the missionary has to give them. Things are going better at Loretto now, but during the first four years when it took to get a good crop, many of the villagers were near starvation. Through it all, that church served as a sort of a symbol and rallying point that helped them through the rough years. It was the first church built in this area of the desert. Through all the hardships, these missionaries maintain their sense of humor. They're cheerful individuals who enjoy their work. A lot of the missionaries are wearing beards. With no shaving cream or hot water to shave, it's much easier just to leave them grow. The beards also make them one of the people and gives them a calming talking point with the villagers. The man on the left was a medical technician before he became a missionary brother. He makes visits to see who needs professional medical care, and he gives limited medical care and advice himself. We mentioned before that the Christians copy some Muslim customs. Well, this is called an Eid, which is a Muslim term for festival or holiday. Every year at the Eid, or feast day of the village, the bishop comes. He marches in this procession, and then they have confirmations. It's one of the biggest holidays of the year. It's difficult to appreciate what these Pakistanis are doing until you realize that it took the missionaries eight years of work to get them to march and sing together. It didn't just happen. We take all these things for granted but they are not used to doing things together. But now, says Mike, they love the Eid, and they look forward to this day. Here again, note the woman carrying her baby while the bishop confirms her. Their babies go everywhere with them. Confirmation, they have another procession. And now that they've been taught to march together, they join in eagerly. This is the highlight of the celebration. The school children putting on this little pageant or play. It brought tears to the eyes of some missionaries who remembered the first pageant years ago and compared the first presentation with this accomplished group of children. Their mothers made all these costumes. That in itself is an accomplishment. And to teach these children all these songs and dance movements was a tremendous undertaking. But now these children are all future leaders. This colorful presentation included the peacock dance by the little girls. This is unusual because the Muslim girls are not allowed to dance in mixed company, even the little girls but the custom is changing under the Christian influence. And usually the little girls will sing only religious songs, but this year they learned a couple of American songs in English. One Mike remembers was, I'm a little teapot. Everyone in the Christian village is very proud of these children and their accomplishments. So Christians and Muslims alike come from miles from around the desert to see this. The city of Multan, a typical city in the Punjab. It's an ancient city. A local rhyme says it is famous for beggars, dust, cemeteries, and heat. As you walk through the city, you can hear the shrill cries of these hundreds of beggars as they keep repeating the same sentence over and over. 
Alms for the sake of Allah. Alms for the sake of Allah. After a while, these cries and moans pierce your ears and stain your mind for hours. The Muslims seldom pass by the beggars because almsgiving is important in the Muslim religion. Alexander the Great went through this city and through these gates in the city of Multan. You have to be careful when you're downtown because one of these oxen could easily run over you if the owner doesn't have a bell tied around its neck. Life in the city is much tougher than it is in the country, on the farms, or in the villages. For one thing, the city is much dirtier. And the social pressures on the Christians are almost unbelievable. Many of them are forced to live in the dirtiest parts of the city. This is about the only kind of work they can find. This is a Christian sweeping the street. In the olden days, before the caste system was outlawed, they would then be called untouchables or outcasts. Anyone who touches the earth is considered unclean, and other families won't eat or drink with them anymore. But the Christians can at least find work in the city by sweeping. So they sweep and are shuttled together in one little section of the city. Water is another problem in the city. This man is called the Bahista, or man from paradise, or man from God. He goes down to the canal and fills up his sacks with water. He has a regular route similar to one our milkman might have. He fills these earthen pots for the women. They use it to cook and wash and other household duties. They pay him whatever they can for this service. He has regular customers that he visits every day. These people weren't home, but like our milkman, he still leaves the water and then he goes on to the next customer. Winding in and out of the passageways that lead from one house to another. Life in the cities for the missionaries is also more difficult than in most villages. But at Multan, they do have the help of these sisters. Some of the most remarkable nuns ever seen. They spend most of their time in the Bastis, the little section of the cities where the sweepers live. Here there is filth everywhere with open sewers running alongside the houses where the children run loose. Their parents are far away from home, sweeping from daylight to dark, and the children are left to do as they please. So these sisters go down into the social nightmare of filth and foul odors and organize the children to give them a little meaning to their lives. They teach them simple catechism, teach them how to read and write. Without the sisters, there'd be no incentive to go to any school. The work of the sisters and the Bastis continues in this foul stench. And it's amazing how they would come into the Bastis with those white clothes on, and when they'd leave, they'd be just as white. Mike said when he left the Basti, he was filthy dirty. This is another young missionary in the city. His name is Father Chris. He's on his first missionary assignment, and it's in one of the tough Bastis, where hundreds of Christians are clustered together. He hasn't learned to speak Urdu very well yet. That's the language or dialect they speak. But just as being there seems to be enough to satisfy them. And this is Father Tom. He wanted to be a movie star at one time. In fact, he got his college degree in dramatics. However, he decided to become a priest. So here he is, he's now performing for these children. 
Father Tom is a handsome fellow, but he's lost 45 pounds since coming to Pakistan. Here is another brother, Brother Thomas Aquinas. He built that beautiful church you saw out in the middle of the desert. He designed it, hired the men to build it, then helped them build it, mostly out of mud bricks. He's been in the mission since he was 18 years old. He's now 26. And this is the physician, Father Luke. He's both a doctor and a priest. He spent 35 years in schools, including college, medical school and the seminary. He's giving these poor people the benefit of all his education. He's also one of the priests who got spinal meningitis from that youth who had pneumonia. He saved Mike's life when Mike went into the coma. Father Luke is sort of centrally located so the other missionaries can bring their sick to him. If you follow the gutters and the sewage, you'll find the Christians, because this is where they are forced to live. The priests who work in these city bosties have a tremendously difficult job. They do much the same as Father Dennis does in the villages. They visit their people, listen to their problems, and do what they can for them. Notice the little girl shooing flies off the baby. They take care of babies when they're very young in Pakistan. You see children four and five years old carrying babies around. Father George, who uses his harmonica to help spread Christianity. He's not a very good musician, but the children don't know the difference and they love to hear him play. He sings all kinds of songs for them, like, I'll be out to get you in a taxi, honey, and other American songs. They love his songs and they squeal at his puppet. He uses the puppet to teach them catechism or any other lesson he thinks they should learn, such as obeying their parents. These scenes explain themselves. You might wonder if all the missionary effort is worth it. Are they making any kind of dent in the society? Do these people appreciate the things being done for them? Is it worth all the tough work traveling on the desert and teaching in the Bosties? Should they just be left to their own ways? They got along before the missionaries got there. Maybe we should just let them go now. But we thought you could make up your own mind by watching these next scenes. Well, Mike's story actually doesn't have an ending because Father Dennis hasn't yet converted everyone in Pakistan and he hasn't taken care of everyone's diseases and fed and clothed everyone. He's still there and still working and so the story has no end. It actually is just a start because when Mike left Father Dennis, he was starting to build his third Christian village. This is the land set aside by the government for the new village. 
From this land, he will guide the building of another city, another Loretto or Fatimapur. It looks like an impossible job, but with the help of God and with the help of friends back home, someday a village will be standing right here. Do you have the valley? Do you 